So let's go over a couple definitions. So compartment syndrome is an increased pressure. Oh, okay. Compartment syndrome is an increased pressure in a fixed cavity of the body with limited compliance. So that limited compliance can be due to fascia, bone, or even tight skin, such as the case with burns. And this leads to ischemia, muscle damage, and organ dysfunction. Intra-abdominal hypertension is defined as a sustained pathologic elevation in intra-abdominal pressure, which is defined as greater than 12 millimeters of mercury for adults and 10 for children. So abdominal compartment syndrome is when you have intra-abdominal hypertension that causes organ dysfunction. And this usually happens with intra-abdominal pressures greater than 20. So what happens with intra-abdominal hypertension? So you can have respiratory dysfunction because the elevated intra-abdominal uh, pressures elevates the diaphragm and causes higher peak airway pressures, which make oxygenation and ventilation difficult. You get renal dysfunction because the intra-abdominal pressure compresses the renal vasculature and prevents flow through the kidney, decreasing the GFR. You can get hemodynamic instability because the pressure compresses the IVC, which causes increased central venous pressures and decreased cardiac output. And then you can have intracranial hypertension. So then elevated intra-abdominal pressures increases intrathoracic pressures, decreasing venous drainage from the head and causing intracranial hypertension. Lastly, the compression on the bowel vasculature causes hypoperfusion and, and compromises the mucosal barrier, which can cause bacterial and toxin intestinal translocation. And there's three types of abdominal compartment syndrome, primary, secondary, and recurrent. Primary is when it starts in the abdomen. So it's a primary intra-abdominal cause, such as trauma, pancreatitis, mesenteric venous obstruction, ascites, small bowel obstruction, ret retroperitoneal hemorrhage. Secondary is when you have such edema from some other process outside of the abdomen, such as sepsis, capillary leak, massive fluid resuscitation, or burns. And recurrent is when you've had abdominal compartment syndrome that's been treated medically or surgically, but happens again. And so here you can see that there's a grading of intra-abdominal hypertension. It goes from grade one to four, four being the worst. And you can see in the, the red and blue pyramids that for grade four intra-abdominal, oh, sorry, grade one intra-abdominal hypertension occurs in about 30% of critically ill patients. And the occurrence decreases as the grade increases. But then you can see as the grade of intra-abdominal hypertension increases, the mortality also increases. So normal intra-abdominal pressures is actually zero millimeters of mercury. But this, this is not normal for everyone. So let's say you're pregnant or you're obese, your intra-abdominal pressure is chronically elevated and that may be normal for you without repercussions. For critically ill patients, the normal is five to seven millimeters of mercury. Intra-abdominal pressures greater than 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury have been associated with decreased organ perfusion. That doesn't mean organ dysfunction, it just means that it decreases the perfusion. But that greater than 20 millimeters of mercury has been associated with organ dysfunction, and at that point you do have abdominal compartment syndrome. So how do you measure intra-abdominal pressures? The best way to measure would probably be to put a catheter inside the peritoneal cavity the way we do when we use a varus needle, or let's say a peritoneal dialysis catheter or a peritoneal, uh, or a peritoneal pigtail. So the best way would just be to transduce the pressure from these catheters. However, it's incredibly invasive. So you can use pressures through intra-abdominal organs, such as nasogastric tubes, rectal tubes, or the most commonly used in the standard of care, which is bladder, bladder catheters, the Foley catheter. So bladder pressures via the Foley catheter is the gold standard because it's widely available, it's low cost, it's incredibly simple to use, and it's minimally invasive. You can't estimate the intra-abdominal pressures using a bladder uh, pressure if there's something wrong with your bladder. So if you have trauma to the bladder, if you have a neurogenic bladder that consistently contracts, benign prostate hypoplasia, pelvic hematoma, you can't use a bladder pressure and you're gonna have to use some other measurement to estimate the intra-abdominal pressure.
Also, intra-abdominal pressures in general are inaccurate if the muscles of the abdomen are contracting or, or if you're in a position where you're increasing your intra-abdominal pressure, putting pressure on the abdomen. Like I said, obesity, pregnancy, radiation cystitis, peritoneal dialysis, these conditions can chronically elevate intra-abdominal pressure. Also, you have to set up the transducer correctly. If you have a leak in the transducer system with any pressure management, because you're releasing pressure through the leak, you can have falsely low readings. So how often do you measure the bladder pressure? When you're concerned for intra-abdominal hypertension, there's no standard, but it's most commonly measured every four to six hours. How do you measure bladder pressure? So this is really tricky. Like I said, it's simple, but it's if you don't do it right, you could get the wrong measurement. So here you can actually see a photo of how you use the Foley catheter. You can see that there's a clamp on the Foley distally and a, tr um, a three-way, um, a three-way valve connected to the Foley, a pressure transducer, and a saline flush. So first you wanna flush the system to get out any air bubbles or um, obstructions that could, uh, that could affect your measurement. Having said that, you don't wanna use more than 25 cc's and that assumes that the bladder is empty. So if you have just put the Foley catheter in, you do wanna let all the urine drain before you start measuring the pressure. You instill the saline to flush out the system and you measure the bladder pressure at end expiration in the supine position, having zeroed the transducer at the level of the iliac crest and mid axillary line. Additionally, once you infuse that saline, the detrusor muscle, the smooth muscle of the bladder is going to contract. So you wanna wait 30 to 60 seconds before you actually record the measurement. And you wanna record it in the standard uh, way, which is in millimeters of mercury. So what do you do when you have intra-abdominal hypertension? The goal is to prevent it from progressing into abdominal compartment syndrome. So you can, decre you can increase the compliance of the abdominal wall by decreasing the muscle contraction, by increasing the patient's sedation, or even paralyzing them. You evacuate uh, luminal contents of the intestine using a uh, nasogastric tube, rectal tubes. You can, if they have a significant fluid collection in the abdomen, such as the case with pancreatitis, you can actually drain that fluid and see if that decreases the pressure. You don't want to fluid overload your patients. So the edema worsens abdominal, uh, the intra-abdominal hypertension. And so you wanna make sure that while your patient is resuscitated, that you maintain a net even balance. And you can correct the positive fluid balance by diuresis or even dialysis. You want, there. this is controversial, but you could also use abdominal perfusion pressure, which is MAP minus the intra-abdominal pressures as, as a measure for resuscitation. And in the literature, the optimum is 50 to 60, but this is controversial and we'll talk about it later. So once you actually progress to abdominal compartment syndrome and you have evidence of organ dysfunction, it's incredibly important to perform an early decompressive laparotomy. So when you, you perform the laparotomy, you keep the abdomen open to decrease the, to open basically the, um, to decompress the intra-abdominal pressure. There are costs to this procedure. It does cause fluid and protein loss. It puts your body in a catabolic state. And the longer you have the abdomen open, you lose your abdominal wall domain. The longer you have it open, you also increase the risk of creating an enterocutaneous, enteroatmospheric fistula. And anyone that's taken care of that knows how difficult they are. So in order to prevent these complications, you wanna make the patient better as soon as possible. And you also wanna close the abdominal wall as soon as possible, which is optimally within four to seven days. You can do this by doing restrictive fluid resuscitation. Like I said, you don't wanna fluid overload the patient. You don't wanna under resuscitate, but you wanna keep the patient resuscitated. You wanna use, so there, it has been shown that negative pressure wound therapy does does um, hasten abdominal closure. And when you can't close the abdomen, but the patient is clinically better, you can use a bridging mesh in order to, to, to provide some sort of definitive closure.
So there's actually a world society of abdominal compartment syndrome, and they have recommendations, they have suggestions, and they have no recommendations, which means that they have no comment on the topic. So, and they update their, rec their um, recommendations. Um, but for example, how do you measure intra-abdominal pressure? That's a recommendation. They recommend that you use protocolized bladder pressure measurements to estimate intra-abdominal pressure. Things that are suggested are things like use of an NG tube or colonic decompression. They even suggest using promotility agents such as neostigmine in the cases of colonic ileus causing um, intra-abdominal hypertension. Things like diuretic and renal replacement therapy, they have no, no recommendations, no comments on. Thank you very much. <laughs>